Hello, the internet, and welcome to my channel. Today on the bench, we have an old lady. It's a 1990 Apple Macintosh SE, which is in need of attention. Let's take a look. Oh, first thing first, I know absolutely nothing about these machines. So <laughs> please don't scream at the screen. This is my first time with Macintosh computers. I'm learning as I go, and I know that I would probably do something which is not the right thing. Be patient with me. Anyways, hopefully you stay with me and you watch what I'm doing. Right, the first thing I would like to do is to inspect things. I don't like just to power up things, which I appreciate it could be totally fine, but I'd like to have a look at the board and potentially I'd like to have a look at the power supply. I have no idea whether these ones have refills inside, but considering the age of the machine, I feel it's always a good idea to just take a look inside. And... Okay, it's a bit dusty, but the battery hasn't leaked, which is great. And I don't really see any major issue here besides dirt. So maybe I could just wipe it. Okay, so much better. I don't see leaked capacitors, even though this is not the one with SMD ones, which I understand is the ones that tend to leak. Right, with the logic board removed, my next step would be to maybe remove the uh, analog board, which is this board here, which is also is driving, well, it's powering the motherboard and it's getting the video signal back, which is then going to the CRT. And it's also, of course, powering the CRT. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to just remove this whole thing and also remove the power supply and see if I can uh, take a peek inside. This whole computer is pretty in a horrendous shape in terms of dust. I mean, look at this. Ugh, that's absolutely horrendous. It's a lot of soot here. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, which is very normal for a CRT. Now, this computer has been switched off for a while. It's totally unlikely that there's any charge in the CRT, but uh, you never know. And here's the analog board out of the chassis. Now the power supply is a Sony. The power supply goes into the analog board and then the analog board through this cable here goes back to the motherboard. And my understanding is it also receives the, the video signal back, which is kind of surprising because nothing here is shielded. So I would say let's remove the power supply from the board and let's open it up. Now, looking at the analog board, I don't see anything wrong here. There are not many capacitors and they all look good. It doesn't mean they work, but I don't see any leak or anything wrong with the capacitors like bulged tops or anything. And here you've got the inside of the Sony power supply. Well, that's where the mains is coming in. That's the main capacitor for the, for the switching. We don't have reefers. I do see filter capacitors, but these are definitely not reefers, which is great. We got our main transformer, the transistors on this side and the diodes on this side, I guess, attached to some heat sinks, which is great. And then we have our filter capacitors here. Oh, this is a bit wonky. I have a feeling it's been, it's been mounted like that at the factory. It is hard to say whether the capacitors there have been leaking because the board is kind of dirty from the factory. I think they just left some residues for, from the production line. At the beginning, I saw that like liquid residue and I thought, well, maybe one of the capacitors or some capacitors are leaking, but then you realize that the whole board is, is like that. I don't see anything massively wrong with this power supply. It looks kind of okay. What I'd like to do now is to test it outside of the Macintosh and make sure that all the voltages are okay. Well, thankfully I found the, the pin out of this power supply. We have to check plus five, two different plus 12 and one minus 12, which is exactly as documented on the power supply itself. I'm not sure what the 12 volt sweep means. I'm assuming they will we will have 12 volts on it. So I have my power supply here is plugged into my current limiter just in case something horrible happens. And I'm assuming it works without a load. Well, if it doesn't, we will know. I'm gonna give power in three, two, one, go. 
and we've got 5.6 which is kind of high but again this is with no load so that's fine then uh, the next one is going to be plus 12 volts for the disk drive it's kind of a low side 11 volts the next one is going to be the minus 12 oh that's not good minus 8 Again, this is with no load and a quick Google search has revealed that this power supply does not really work very well without loads. I don't think I want to invest time on this. It's powered up with no smoke and I got some voltages out. So I think I'll risk it a bit and check voltages later. But I do need to come up with some appropriate loads for the most common voltages so I can test these things a bit better next time. For now, let's reassemble the unit. Right, I think I've got everything back together including the drives the mac is already powered at the back so i'm gonna power it here at the my current limiter and let's see what happens in three two one go drives are spinning flop is sticking all oh, right oh, we got something on screen something unhappy i'd like to say right here we go we got a sad mac face with oh um okay <laughs> But well, something happened that just got close to it. And that could be either, I would say, a bad solder joint or maybe a capacitor which has started working again after being powered a bit. I'm glad I had it on camera. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. I'll do a little bit of search for that and see what that means. Well, since I'm here, I would say let's check these voltages. That's the power connector at the back of the motherboard. I'm not sure we have the, the disk 12 volts in there. For that, we'll have to go somewhere else. So we have minus five on the six, pin number six. Yeah, and that's all more or less perfect. Minus 12 on the next one. And it is so much better than it was before. <laughs> so it is definitely working. Plus 12 at the last one. Yes, plus 12. Okay, the voltages are okay. The disc is spinning. So I can measure the 12 volts from here. Because the drive is getting five volts here. And I should have plus 12, yeah, plus 12 volts. It's totally fine. So thankfully the power supply works. I don't know how well it works, but I know I have voltages out of it. Right, according to the, the dead max scrolls, uh, error code basically 0000004 over whatever, which is this one, is a RAM problem. So hopefully it's just a matter of resetting those uh, RAM modules. At this point, the computer started behaving erratically. Each boot up delivers a different outcome. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And check out this weird behavior after one of the power cycles. Anyways, with the system running, I can see four megabytes of RAM, and I think this is system 604, but I'm not sure. I also now see some issues with the monitor. The jitter you see in the picture is the vertical deflection, which is the magnetic field driving the electron beam up and down, stopping momentarily. For that, I will need to take a look at the analog board at some point. I tried putting a diskette in the drive. Yes, it's a 1.44 megabytes MS-DOS floppy. I know this is not going to work well, on an 800k drive, but double density disks are in the post. However, the computer refused to initialize it and the mechanism jammed, so the disk got stuck inside. Uh, I guess it's another issue to add to the file. So I think this Macintosh has four problems. We have the memory issue, which is likely causing the video corruption as well. The flop is not working and the picture is jittery. Finally, the CRT is a bit burned, but maybe I could swap it with one from another machine I have, which seems to be okay. But let me bring the machine back to life first. Now, let's take the motherboard out and let's take a look at those memory modules. Hopefully, they just need to be reseated. Now, the problem with these uh, memory slots are these very, very fragile plastic clips. I'll do my best not to break them. The error code is pointing to a specific memory module, but to be honest, I think I'd like to remove them all, clean the sockets, clean the uh, connectors on the memory sticks themselves, put them back and see if anything changes. If I still have the error message, then I will definitely go back and maybe look at the one that the software um, is actually reporting as bad.
These are pretty dirty, so I'll give them a clean with compressed air and then I'll use some uh, contact cleaner and at the same time I will clean the connectors here. Do I see? Oh yeah, look at that. I think we found a problem. I'm actually surprised that that was working in the first place. So there's definitely some corrosion that's quite kind of weird because the board is in good shape. I don't have corrosions anywhere else. So I'm not sure where this is coming from. The back, ooh, the back is bad. It's made by Samsung, by the way. Let's have a look at the others. Now this looks good. No, the others are good. So I guess we found our problem. So I'll try and look into the into the slots and see if I see anything. Oh, there it is. Don't know what happened there because again, the battery is on the opposite side of the board. And I guess this is just age. That needs a little bit of uh, vinegar. And then I'll brush it nicely. And uh, hopefully that's our problem. Now, since I have a microscope here, I'm just curious to have a look. That's the memory module. And that comes off. But the blue stuff does. Then it depends on how much of the pad is still working underneath. And this is the connector on the motherboard. So yeah, it looks like the um, corrosion came from the stick and not from the motherboard. Because um, again, I see very little damage here. It's And it's only where basically the contacts were touched in the memory module. Yeah, it works pretty well. So this is the outcome of the motherboard after a little bit of scrubbing. What it looks like is that the coating of these clips has been corroded and I don't know exactly what's underneath. Is that copper? Because if it's copper, the copper eventually will oxidize. We might have lost some uh, reliability in the future, I guess. You see that like the normal connector, the normal clip is shiny while these ones are not shiny anymore. And I think I see the copper underneath. Now this is the memory module after soaking into vinegar for a while. Now let's see what happens when I use my fiber pen here. Why do I have a feeling the fiber pen doesn't work as effectively when the surface is wet? Uh, I guess this doesn't look good, right? I think that's the copper under, under the coating, whatever coating that is. I think the best solution here would be to remove the corrosion, which is only the coating from what I can see, and then apply some, uh, some solder. Right, this is the outcome. I'm pretty pleased by it. You can see the corrosion underneath, but it's um, evenly and fully covered by solder. So hopefully this will work. The other seams are in good conditions. So I'm gonna just clean them with isopropyl and I'll do the same on the motherboard sockets. Okay, I've got the motherboard back in with the memory modules. Everything is connected, including my mouse. Let's power it up and see if this time it works a bit better. So three, two, one, go. Um, no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, sorry for the interruption. I caught these in post-production. For a moment, the picture was a horizontal line which means the vertical deflection was completely not working. I thought I would highlight this as I will have to look at that issue later on. Now back to our memory issue. It's the same error message, but this time the hard drive is struggling to power up, I guess. So it's the same exact error message. If I understand correctly, the second line describe the position of the memory module. Now, when I reinstall the memory modules, I make sure that the module I say fixed was in a different slot. And if I'm reading this right, it points to an issue with the slot itself or maybe with the motherboard. That's not great. So what I think I'm gonna do next is to remove the logic board again and test different memory modules from a different Macintosh and see what happens. Unfortunately, the modules I wanted to use are not in great shape. So I think I'm going to use a slightly different contact cleaner, which is this one. This one is for switches. It should basically increase 
um, continuity. This is not the dry one, so it's important that you don't spray too far away. But I think this is fine. I mean, it's not conductive. It just helps with the contact. So I'll spray it at one on all the sockets and, and see where it goes from there. The error message we have on screen is, seems to point to seam number two on this type of uh, logic board. And guess what? This is seam number two. That's the one that we've been inspecting. I guess the memory module is hopefully fixed and uh, the corrosion that we've seen on this one is preventing the good content from happening. Okay, motherboard is back in. I've cleaned and scrubbed and done everything I could, but it's still with the existing memory module. So let's give it a go and see what happens. In three, two, one, go. Well, there is a beep, which I think it didn't happen earlier. The flop is doing stuff. See the hard drive? Oh yes, okay. Yeah, it is booting up. The flop is seeking. I think it's got kind of stuck a bit. Uh, now the thing is, you know, it was booting up before. I guess I'll have to test it a bit. Now, so far so good. I have a little problem. I have placed an order for the floppy emu. The thing is, I just ordered it. It's Christmas time. It hasn't arrived yet. I really don't have a way to connect to this computer besides the floppy. Now, if the flop is not working, it's a problem because <laughs> I think I should be able to make some floppies using Windows. I'm not sure. I need to test. But if the flop itself is not ejecting or loading properly or reading properly or whatever happens to this floppy, I don't really know what to do. I would say what I'm going to do now, I'm going to test it a bit and, you know, power cycle it, uh, let it run a bit, let's make sure it works. What I can do, I can take a look at the floppy, which is the next of our problems. Right, good news. I have restarted this a number of times. I left it off, went for dinner, came back, powered on again, and it powered up totally fine. So it looks like the memory error that we were seeing before is now fixed. So problem number one is gone. And I also like to mention that, yeah, the noise that I'm hearing sometimes when he, the unit is powering up is the hard drive. It's kind of getting better. I'm assuming maybe it needs to work a bit to resolve whatever mechanical problem it has inside. I'm not sure whether this hard drive has a head actuated by a stepper motor. In that case, it might be possible just to, act, uh, to access the shaft of the motor and see if by any chance I can put some lubricant. So the next one is going to be remove the floppy drive and uh, take a look at it. And here's the floppy drive, which is a Sony model MPF51W-23. As you can see, this is pretty dirty. So let me disassemble it first and then um, I'll try and give it a clean. Right, here's our drive. And uh, as you can hopefully see, yeah, it's uh, the usual horrible, dusty, horrendous floppy drives. <laughs> Let me let me try and clean this thing a bit and we move from there. But it's not bad. The good news is that I don't see corrosion. I mean, the PS2 was in much worse condition. So let me give it a clean and, uh, and we'll see what happens then. Okay, I gave the drive a clean, but I didn't really start lubricating or anything. I do you see it's in need of lubrication? What I've done, I have reassembled the motherboard onto the Macintosh without the hard drive, and I plugged the floppy into the motherboard. So I can see what's happening with this drive. Now, I don't know whether this is one of those where the plastic cog fails. Uh, I guess so, <laughs> but I do not know, but I wanna see what happens. It is very slow. Uh, it is telling me that it needs to be initialized. Okay, I'm in, in, initializing it now. The disc is spinning, the head is moving, and it is kind of ejecting it with an error message. I don't know why it says initialization fa failed. Um, I'm, maybe these are not the right hard drives. Don't, don't shoot at me because I don't know these things. I have a feeling it just needs a little bit of lubrication. So give me five minutes while I put a little bit of lubricant on all these little joints, which are, they, they feel, not only they do feel dry, but the existing lubricant has dried up and it's just, a big gunk now and it's actually having the opposite effect.
Right, I'm getting somewhere. This is the actuator, which is basically loading and ejecting the disc. So when the disc is slided in, you see that frame, the metal frame is going that direction. Basically what happens is this spins, there's this little pin on top. By spinning, it's just pulling this thing which is ejecting the drive. Now the whole mechanism is very sticky. You know, I can see why it's struggling. I'm struggling myself. I'm trying to remove just the loading mechanism. I have a feeling it's just the whole thing that comes out without having to touch the heads or anything. Once it's out, I could actually wash it in some white spirit. That will dissolve all the gunk and everything from all these little connections. And then I can just re-lubricate and it's gonna be a world of difference. I found a video online from uh, what app TK here, which I'm gonna link down below, obviously. Currently, what we have to do here is to loosen this, um, these two springs here. push this thing this direction and then this one this direction there you go because we need to slide out the whole mechanism here this plastic bit here is basically guiding the top head and we need to remove it so now i think it's just a matter of removing this thing Again, this now can go in a bath of um, white spirit. Fantastic. Now for the bottom part, these little soft washers need to come out or come off. Yeah, I can feel it's gunky. This whole thing is, is not sliding properly. This is gonna come out brand new. Once you have these four soft washers uh, removed, there you go. You have the bottom thing and you can clean absolutely everything. You can see residues here of the grease, of the lubricant, which is not lubricant anymore. I mean, this is, well, I don't know what this is. And here I managed to open the, the eject motor and I think this one is the one that normally fails. It looks like, well, it's definitely one piece. I have a few Macintosh to fix. I guess I might want to buy the, uh, the replacement. Maybe I can put some lubricant tomorrow. And I've got my white lithium grease, which I'm going to apply on the drive. Obviously, I'm not going to spray the grease on the drive. What I'm going to do, I'm going to use some um, cotton buds and maybe some small screwdriver to only apply the grease where the metal is basically wrapping against each other. As you can see, I mean, now it's, it feels amazing. Okay, it's done. I'm, uh, <laughs> I have to say, I'm pretty curious to see the outcome of this. Well, let's give it a go and see what happens. Oh yeah, it definitely slides in firmly. Uh, I think it's kind of crashed. The mouse has stopped working. Oh my gosh, it's not good, right? <laughs> so to test the eject mechanism, I disconnected the hard drive, powered up the Mac and waited for the question mark. This is an MS-DOS floppy disk, so you won't like it, and you should spit it out straight away. And yeah, the mechanism feels so much better now. Back to the mouse issue. Unfortunately, it seems that after my last power-up, the mouse has stopped working. I'm not sure what happened, let me show you. The Macintosh boots up, it uh, reaches the desktop, and when I try to move the mouse, the cursor doesn't move, and instead it's like I click the button because the Apple menu opens. Then nothing else happens, and it's like the computer is completely frozen. Now, if I stick an unformatted floppy in the drive before I move the mouse, I get the expected dialog warning me the, need, the disk needs to be initialized. 
But if I move the mouse first to say crash the computer and then I stick a flop in the drive, no dialog shows up indicating that the computer might be frozen. Still, I can always display the debug window by pressing one of the buttons at the side of the board. And that is telling me that the computer is not completely frozen. If I disconnect the hard drive and wait for the floppy with a question mark, I should be able to move the cursor there, but it doesn't work. And that is telling me that this is not a software issue. I also booted the Macintosh from uh, another hard drive and I had the same issue. So it's either a logic board issue or a mouse issue. Now, without a mouse, I cannot test a floppy drive, unfortunately. So first of all, I ordered a replacement mouse and a keyboard this time. And while I'm waiting, I started looking into the ADB, Apple Desktop Bus, which is how the mouse talks to the logic board, to see if I could see anything wrong. ADB, first of all, is a bidirectional serial communication protocol. What goes to the mouse is only ground plus five volts and the signal cable. The signal cable is used by all the peripherals, which you can connect onto these two connectors here. And the communication is basically handled by this motherboard. The motherboard is in control and all the devices connected to the motherboard, they basically need to request permission to send the data to the motherboard before they can do that. The motherboard basically manages the bus. So the bus is shared with all the peripherals. Each one of the devices that you can connect to the ADB, they have an address. So the way it works, the computer will say, hey, device address number, I don't know, number three, which could be the mouse. You can now talk and tell me your position and the mouse will send a position. Or if it's a printer, it will say, hey, device number, I don't know, seven, which is the printer. This is for you for whatever you have to do. If a device needs to send something to the computer, there's a basically a, a specific request to use the bus command and the computer will say, okay, device number, whatever, now you can send your data. Now here on the motherboard, the mouse connects to one of these two ports here. It goes through a filter. I think it's uh, interference with rejection or something like that. From here, the signals are going into this little chip here, which is the ADB chip, which is the Apple desktop bus control chip. This chip is getting the signals from the bus which goes to, to all your peripherals, and it translates it into a way which can be understood by the VIA, the versatile interface adapter. The ADB is not really getting much. So it's getting the input from the ADB, it's getting obviously plus five volts, ground. It's also getting some clock from this chip here, GLU, I think it's the, the generic logic unit. Then it, it only has some lines to talk to the VIA. Now, if you're looking here on the schematics, here on the right hand side, you see the two ports ports, the two ADB ports, and as you can see, uh, pin number four is ground, pin number three is plus five volts, and pins number one, which I'll link together here, they go into the ADB. The bus is pulled high by this resistor 470 ohm, which goes to five volts, and if I understand it correctly, when the computer needs to talk to this bus is basically driving pin number one, which is driving the base of this transistor, and the transistor basically pulls down the whole signal to basically make the square waves so the computer can talk to the devices. The ADB chip has our ground connection, five volts connection, and then it's getting this, it doesn't say it's a clock, but uh, I can tell you it's a clock on pin 16 from this GLU chip. And the GLU is then getting the, the clock from this DIO quartz, which is 15.7 megahertz. After the ADB chip has converted the, the ADB bus signals into something which can be understood by the VIA, you have these five lines, eight, nine, 10, 17, and 18, which, uh, are going to the VIA, which again is this chip down here. Now, I don't see many components here. There's a filter here. We have two resistors, we have one transistor, and that's it. These are the two resistors. That's the transistor. I have checked them already. The resistors are checking out. The transistor is fine. And I've checked all continuity between the ADB ports into the um, ADB control chip. I've checked that the ADB control chip is actually linked to the VIA. And I checked that the five volts ground and clocks are coming from the boards and from the GLU chip. 
So everything checks out, uh, which is a bit disappointment because I was hoping for something easy. At this point, I just want to fire up the oscilloscope and see if by any chance I can see anything that rings a bell or that looks wrong. The first thing I'd like to do here, if I'm looking at the schematics, uh, I'd like to know whether there's something coming in on pins two and three, which are linked together, which is the ADB bus. Okay, so this is pin number two. Pin number three is going to be identical and I do see something happening. So it looks like there is some communication. Now, what happens if I move the mouse? Okay, I do see something happening there. I move the mouse and something happened. It looks like there is communication between the mouse and the ADP chip. Now let's move to pin number one. Pin number one should be the computer talking to the, to the ADB, basically sending commands onto the ADB bus. Okay, now this signal is the opposite and it's smaller, but again, this is going to the base of a transistor and then eventually is driving the bus. Now I'm back on pin two. You are basically seeing both the mouse and the computer talking. While if I'm going on pin one, it's only the computer talking, which is then going onto the bus. So, so far, so good. Pin 16 should be some sort of clock, 3.67 megahertz. We know that we have communication coming on pin two and three. Does this make it its way to the VIA? So I'm going to check pin eight, nine, 10, 17, 18 and see if something happens when I move the mouse, because that means the chip is actually doing its job and sending the information back to the VIA. Right, so this is pin number eight. I do see some activity by itself. Now, what matters to me is if I move the mouse, does the communication increase? And it does. I move the mouse and I see data coming out of the chip, which is telling me the chip is doing its job. Now let's check pin number nine, which is the next one. If I move the mouse, you can see that something happens. Then I have pin number 10, which is this one. And if I move the mouse, move the mouse, something happens. Then we have 17 and 18. And if I move the mouse, we got something. And number 18, again, if I move the mouse, I do see something. So not knowing much about the ADP, this is my first time looking into that, it looks healthy. So if my VIA interface between the VIA and the ADP chip is showing some activity when I move the mouse, it means that the ADP chip is doing, is sending that communication. Again, the VIA doesn't have any way to know that the mouse is being moved. Now I found this guide to the Macintosh family hardware manual and it's very well made. I went to check the ADB section and it describes the ADB that down to the signal construction and how it works in terms of bits being exchanged between the devices, the peripherals and the ADB chips. So what I've learned from this manual is that each of the ADB transactions between the motherboard and in this case the mouse are made by these components here. There's an attention signal, a sync signal, there's a one command byte which is basically telling whether the, the device can talk or speak, there's a one stop bit and then there's a data packet which in the case of the mouse is going to be where the mouse is moving, where the, the button has been pushed and I'm here looking at the actual signal. So Every time there is a transaction on the bus, I should be able to see this attention pulse and a sync pulse. And then I have in binary, obviously, I have four bits, which basically set the address of the device, which is allowed to talk or which is receiving the information, depending whether it's one way or the other. Then again, we have the command whether, again, it's a information being sent or request to information to be received, like in the case of the mouse. Then there's a register, which to be honest, I'm not sure I understood what it is. There's a stop bit, and then there's a bunch of information, which is again, in the case of mouse, is the mouse telling the motherboards where I'm moving, how fast I'm moving. Well, that's my position, basically. So what we see here is pin number two, which we know is the ADB bus. And I see this signal is repeating. It doesn't change, there's nothing. Again, unless I touch the mouse, there's nothing happening. So let's pause this uh, signal for a minute and let's take a look at it. So if I'm comparing what the manual says in the oscilloscope, I can recognize the attention signal and this is my sync pulse. 
So what happens immediately afterwards, that the, the first four bits is the address. And if I'm not mistaken here, I see a 0010. 0010 in decimal is two. Now two, looking um, according to the manual, is the keyboard. So the ADB chip is sending a message to the keyboard. Let's see what the message is. 0010, and then we have 11. Now 11, you can see here, is talk. So the computer is basically authorizing the keyboard to send information, which is the only thing that the keyboards can do. But remember, the keyboard cannot send information until the ADB chip is basically saying, hey, the bus is yours, you can send your information. Uh, let's start the oscilloscope again. I'm back to pin two. So that's the same exact signal. Pay close attention to one of these four bits, which is the address. The moment I move the mouse, something might happen. Three, two, one, go. One single bit has changed. So we now have 0011 as an address. Now 0011 in decimal is three. And according to this manual, three is reserved to the mouse. So the mouse basically sent a request to speak. And the ADB chip said, yeah, mouse, I can hear you. Please talk, because I have one one here, which is command for talk. What this is telling me is the ADB chip is actually receiving information from address three, which should be the mouse and it's authorizing the mouse to send information to the bus, to use the bus, and I'm assuming the ADB chip is receiving that information. From what I can see here, the communication is happening, the chip is responding correctly to the request from the mouse, the mouse is sending information, and then the information is being sent to the VIA. Then I don't know what happens next, but the thing is, something happens after that. From my point of view, this section of the, of the board where the mouse is connected and is getting information which is being fed to the VIA is working totally fine. Now, if I want to dig a bit more inside the logic of this board, um, after the ADB, we said that the signal is going into the VIA, the versatile interface adapter. And it's coming through here. It's called the port B and port A is the RTC. I do also see there's an IRQ going into pin 21. Well, I'd like to show you something which I think is helping in the diagnostic here. So this is pin 21, as you can see is, yeah, it's doing something by itself. See what happens when I move the mouse. Now, right now, the mouse is frozen on screen. If I move the mouse, you see lots and lots of ERQ happening. Also, if I'm going on pin 24, which is the select chip from the VIA, as you can see, there's kind of normal activity. And if I move the mouse, you have much more activity. So that's another demonstration that the signal is coming through the mouse into the ADB, into the VIA, and it's also getting out of the VIA somehow. Something's happening here. It's not like it's that the mouse is dead. I don't think a new mouse is going to sort out anything. Now, I found this block diagram here, that's for the Macintosh SE, and you can see here it got the Apple desktop bus going into the ADB, into the VIA. We know the VIA is doing the ADB and the RTC. The VIA is then, it's also, the IRQ is controlled by the BBU, which is more or less some sort of a, like the main chipset of the system. The BBU happens to be socketed. So maybe I'd like to take a look at that. Let's take it out, clean it with a little contact cleaner uh, and see if that by any chance changes anything. Right, the chip is out and it's in uh, great condition. So again, there's definitely no corrosion here. I'm gonna clean it thoroughly, including the sockets, put it back and see if that changes anything. Now, if I'm looking better, there is a tiny bit of corrosion on some of these pins. Moment of truth. Nope. So, still, we're still a square one. I think I'd like to pause this video here. We got the computer working, but then it broke again. But the floppy drive is hopefully sorted. Now I'm waiting for a replacement mouse, a keyboard, and the floppy emu, and then I will resume the repair. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would appreciate if you could hit the like button down below and also consider subscribing to my channel if you like what I'm doing here on my, on my channel. For now, thanks for watching. I wish you a great day and I hope to see you again soon here on my channel for my next video. Goodbye.